All right, 99.9 Punk World Radio FM, we got a very special interview broadcast coming your way. We are joined by legendary Canadian actor. This individual is known as the mailroom guy in Elf. He also had a brief role in I'll Be Home for Christmas, Supernatural, Smallville, I Could Be Here Till the Early Morning Hours, just naming every single role he this man has had his hand in we got the one and only the phenomenal mark Aikson right here live on the radio station airwaves and of course youtube and facebook as well mark how are you doing tonight i'm doing uh i'm doing great uh fantastic this is uh my time of year to shine so i'm always happy and I got to say, I'm definitely happy to speak with you. I got to say, I've been a fan. Like I told you before we went live, I've been a fan of your work for so many years. I remember first discovering your acting in Elf when I was younger. Now I get to show that movie to my to my children and vice versa. It's crazy just to know that it's a 20th, uh, yeah, 20th, 20th anniversary this year of that movie. Yeah, it's a bit shocking. Sometimes I have to slap myself in the face to figure it out. But uh, uh, I was uh, 46 when I did that. I'm 66 now. And I can't believe that people are still talking about uh, the movie, but I'm really glad. And I know that it's it's a great movie. I was just lucky enough to be in it. That's all. And before we actually talk about Elf, I got to take you back to the very beginning where you actually began acting in college at Studio 58 at the age of just 15 years old. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about those college days. And of course, what actually made you decide to venture into acting in your mid-teens? Wow, you've certainly done your research. You've gone all the way back to the Mesozoic era. Uh, yeah, I was uh, um, in college in the 70s uh, and uh, went to uh, theater school from... Uh, traveling down to the Yukon. And uh, back then, all there was was stage and theater. Uh, that was what, uh, if you're going to be an actor, that's where you uh, uh, were organizing, where you were focused on. And uh, um, for the first 10 years of my life after college, that's all I did was stage. Uh, Shakespeare, Ibsen, uh, you know, all, all the great authors and stuff. And it was only later that uh, film and TV became a reality for me, uh, you know, in my 20s. Uh, but uh, I did enter uh, Studio 58 uh, at the last month of my 15th year, and then I started 16. Uh, full, I mean, that's when I was 16, uh, uh, doing my first years in, in college, and then uh, went right on from there. I've never stopped. And also, speaking of going on from there and never stopping, you were also one of the founding members of a Janus Theater where you actually appeared oh God, on man. stage for eight eight years, including oh, a, yeah. uh, including that season at the art uh, sorry the arts club. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about your days on stage and was it a difficult transition actually going from the stage to an, actually in front of a camera? Because I've heard it's a complete opposite of one another when it comes to acting. It, it, it is. It very much is. Uh, you know, uh, when you're uh, acting on stage, you have to project. You have to act for the last person in the farthest row uh, so that they feel uh, like they're involved. But in a film, it's like think it and then you do it. You don't uh, act it. I mean, it's a much more a much more refined, uh, much more lower key thing. I, I love the stage. I really did. I, I enjoyed the live audiences quite a bit. And it, it was uh, something that gave me a lot of confidence to go into film and TV. Uh, but the permanence of film and TV struck me uh, immensely. Because when you do stage, when you work on stage for three months or something like that, and it's great, it's wonderful, but when it's over, it's over. It's like uh, dust in the wind. Uh, but when you do something on film and TV, sometimes, every once in a while, like this show, it lasts, and, and it's like a legacy, and it makes a, a person feel really proud. And when you were actually on stage, because I've been to a lot of plays and whatnot, I kind of kind of got the vibe of how it actually kind of works on theater, but when you actually mess up a line or anything like that, because obviously this is all live in front of an audience, mistakes <laughs> always happen. Well, what what, what kind of happens when you actually mess up a line? Do you guys just go with it, or like how did it really work back in... Uh, back in your days with the uh, with the Janus operation. Yeah, I mean, uh, when we had our own theater company for the first uh, few years after getting out of college, uh, it was all our own show. Uh, we had our own theater for a few short years, uh, but it was a fly by the seat of your pants. If something goes wrong, you have to fix it right on the moment and go on, because there's no take two on stage. 
that's the big difference between stage and film. You know, you do film and something goes wrong, an airplane goes by, or you mess up your line or something like that. You can do I take two. That's fine. But on stage, you have to work it through. It. You know, you have to, and that's where uh, a film uh, um, a stage uh, group is much more uh, an ensemble where you support each other, right? And when somebody had dropped the ball, you pick it up for them and you continue on as a team. Uh, but the technical people in film and TV help you through that, you know, so that uh, you don't have to depend on the other actors to fudge you through the lines. And also, one of your actual very first movie roles was actually where you portrayed Bob Sheldon in the film Skip Trace in the year 77. Dude, from what you, you actually can really recall. you are killing me now. You are seriously <laughs> killing me now. I mean, my God, man. I mean, what did you do? Did you get, like, detectives to go through my resume and stuff like that? Yeah, Skip Tracer, the first actual uh, film role that I got. And I was tickled to get it. It was a great, great movie. Uh, and uh, I had a small part in it, but uh, the director um, uh, um, liked what he was hearing as far as ad libs, and he put it into the movie, and then I got a bigger role. But but uh, I, I was so happy to do that. Uh, it was like my first time in front of a camera compared to live audience. I'm really impressed, man. I mean, you really did your homework. Uh, I'm really impressed. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Like I, I, I always like doing, you know, research based interviews. I know a lot of other interviewers, they ask kind of the same questions, but I love making sure that every interview I do is unique and different for each individual. And especially being a fan of yours, I knew I had to go all out and make sure I give you the best possible interview I can actually provide. I've done a few interviews uh, lately, you know, because of the 20th. I mean, I did the Daily Mail a little while ago. There's a, a global interview with me tonight. Uh, on uh, on uh, the news with Squire Barnes. You know, I'm getting a lot of because of the 20th anniversary, but nobody, nobody did their research like you did. Right? I mean, I mean it's Skip Tracer. You give me shivers, you know, because, I mean, that doesn't mean a lot to many people, but that's my first film role and uh, means a lot to me. Thank you. And you're most certainly welcome. Before we move up to the topic of Skip Tracer, because I actually didn't know a, your part was actually ad-libbed. I was wondering if you can actually tell us what parts for that you actually can remember, because obviously this is a movie from a long time ago. What parts that were did you actually ad-lib that actually did indeed make it to the actual uh, feature presentation film? Well, um, that doesn't happen very often. It's a chemistry of uh, the stars and the director for something like that to happen. It's happened a couple of times, not often, right? Uh, when I was hired for Elf, um, um, I had auditioned for another role that they cut a long time earlier, uh, where I picked up Buddy uh, in a truck and I drove him from uh, North Pole to like, uh, you know, like New York or something like that. Uh, but uh, um, they cut that role and uh, I didn't hear from him again. And then all of a sudden, uh, my agent goes, Mark, they want you to come down and read one line with Will Ferrell. Just one line. Are you willing to do that? Because it's tonight, and will you do it? And I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I'm a big Will Ferrell fan, yeah. And so all I was supposed to say was work release. And uh, I did that. I thought, this is going to be a fast day. You know, two hours, three hours, and said, I'm going home, and it's all good. Uh, and then all of a sudden they wanted to play and, and have fun and stuff. And I couldn't figure it out until much later that this was the very last day of shooting of the movie. There was no other uh, photographic uh, work being done on the movie after that day. So there's no turnaround. They could work the crew. They could work the actors as long as they wanted to uh, uh, because it was the very last day. And so they shot us for 22 hours that day. And uh, they just kept add, adding st stuff, you know, like Favreau and, and, and Will Ferrell. This is what, you know, let's try this, let's try this, you know. And 22 hours later, that's what uh, that day ended up with, you know. Um, it's it, amazing. It's I, I mean, I've had lots that. of roles that have gone like two, three months or something like that. But to have one day, um, and most of it end up on, on uh, the end product. Most of it has survived was amazing to me and uh, it changed my career 
and especially 20 years later, individuals are still like watch. Like I like I mentioned, people are watching it from 2003 every year. It's actually one of my uh, holiday traditions. I watch it about two or three times during the holiday season because it's Elf. You can't really watch. It's kind of like Lay's chips. You can't really have just one. You gotta <laughs> you gotta watch it a couple times throughout it. Sure, that that's a good analogy. I, I you know I'm I'm an older guy. And I remember uh, uh, Christmas classics very clearly you know like uh, uh it's a wonderful life or a uh, miracle on 34th street those movies uh, meant a lot to me when i was growing up this movie i mean it's a lot of people growing up now and and that's a, a real uh, compliment and and uh just a, a real bonus to me in the whole thing i just can't believe how well uh, it all worked out and while we're actually still on the topic of holiday movies, another one that you were actually in, which I will actually admit, Mark, I actually did not know this until the other night when I actually was watching it, and I literally sat up, I was like, wait, that's Mark, which is I'll Be Home for Christmas, where you're actually credited as the sandwich guy on the bus. I was wondering if you could actually oh, just tell yeah. us a bit more about that role, and what was it like just working alongside uh, Jonathan Taylor Thomas? Uh, they, they, they were great, and it was fun. Uh, we shot down uh, uh, yeah, near the Stevenson Highway where the uh, the uh, uh, gardens were, you know, at the time. Uh, um, but uh, uh, I've been uh, basically, you know, uh, not used for any Christmas movies since Elf. Uh, you know, for obvious reasons, right? I mean, uh, people have pigeonholed me for that, so you know, people are reticent to cast me in another Christmas movie. This is one of the few that they let me eat a sandwich, get really bloody, and pretend it was a uh, heart transplant. And that was uh, the crux of the, the joke when I, I did in, in the I'll Be Home for Christmas. But uh, one of the very few Christmas movies I've done beyond Elf because they, they really have uh, already put me uh, away, you know, as far as other Christmas movies, I think. And also, as well, aside from like the the Christmas side of things for uh, for a little bit, you were also actually uh, you sorry you actually appeared in the WB's hit television series Supernatural on not one but two separate occasions where you actually played uh, adult adult Hansel and Tooth Fairy. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about you know being able to work on the set of Supernatural, and of course, how did all those opportunities come to be for you? I, I had so much fun on Supernatural. Uh, the guys were great. Jared and uh, Jason were they were wonderful uh, people. Um, my first bit was just a cameo, right, uh, where I played the tooth fairy and uh, um, horrible kind of visual, but like I'm pulling teeth out of an adult's mouth, you know, and saying this might pinch just a bit. And I'm taking pliers and I'm pulling the teeth out. But but to the second one was a guest starring role uh, uh, in season 11, 10 or 11. Uh, where I played Gretel and uh, Hansel and uh, to Hansel and Gretel and uh, I had a lot of fun in that one as well and the guys welcomed me back and they went ah oh, you're the tooth fairy we're glad to see you again and stuff and uh, that was a lot of fun to do that I mean uh, that was a great set uh, very warm you know and I don't think you had to travel very far for that role as well because if I'm not mistaken Supernatural was actually filmed out there in, uh, in the Vancouver BC area yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, most of it was done, uh, you know, in studio, stuff like that. But uh, Supernatural was all centered in uh, Vancouver. I, I have a, a happy distinction of having performed multiple episodes in five of the longest running uh, uh, sci-fi uh, series in Vancouver, which includes uh, um, uh, X-Files, Stargate, uh, Supernatural, um, um, a smallville i mean just to name a, a part of them but but uh uh it's been a, a great uh, thing to be a part of those dynamic series because they all had a lot of life you know supernatural still there's lots of conventions out there for for those guys and stuff and it was a lot of fun and I was just going to mention as well, uh, Smallville is another phenomenal show you were a part of. And that lasted pretty well, I, I believe, 10, or, uh, 10 seasons, actually. Such an amazing run that Smallville had. They don't, they don't make TV shows like that anymore, if, I, if I'm being completely honest. No, no, they don't. You know, and, and that's, uh, that's uh, uh, you know, the reason why I got in there is because they lasted so long. And they could wait until, you know... Uh, people had already forgotten about me as the tooth fairy. I come back as something else. But X Files was 
the same thing. It was a big uh, fun and boost to come back. Psych, I did the original uh, um, uh, pilot for Psych. And, uh, and then 11 years later, I got to do the finale movie of Psych, pr- playing the same character. They just, they, again, I didn't have to audition. They just went, dude, uh, we're doing the wrap up on the whole series. We'd like you to come back and play the same guy, which had this thing uh, tattooed across his forehead you know, going a born loser or something like that, which, you know, uh, makes a lot of sense if you know me. But but uh, that was like my thing through the whole stick of, of Psych. And, and that was fun, you know, to be at the beginning. I was the very first scene that they filmed in Psych. And I was in the very last uh, uh, movie finale of Psych, which was a lot of fun for me. But other series the same. It would mean, really be really good to me. And also as well, April 18th of 2008, you actually had the opportunity to work alongside the now unfortunately late great Matthew Perry. I was wondering in the film Numb. I was wondering if you can actually you can tell us a bit more about uh, how you guys shared a jail cell in that scene. And of course, what was it like just working alongside Matthew Perry for for that short time in that film? I have to say something here. Um, um, there was a, a thing uh, three four weeks ago, uh, just before Matt died. Uh, where they were asking actors to just put a picture out of a, a day's work and uh, to support the actors that were on strike. And so before Matt died, I, I was looking through our pictures and I picked uh, a picture with him and I because it was uh, one of those movies where I wasn't a bad guy, which is very few and far between. I was a nice guy, just sort of like Elf. And I chose that picture, and then three days later, he died. And, and so I had to explain to people, you know, I, I didn't know. I mean, you know, this was not, I mean, look at the dates. I did not try to post this when he died, because I would not do that. But uh, he was a wonderful guy. I mean, um, I remember knowing that he was Chandler, seeing dozens of, of uh, Friends episodes, knowing how much of a, a a formidable uh, character he was and an actor he was. And then, you know, even when I was shooting on set, you'd be hearing uh, crowds outside of the circus yelling, Chandler, Chandler. I mean, you just knew that this is a big guy, but but he never uh, pushed his ego. He was always the most uh, giving and, and nice guy. I only knew him for a month, just a month. But um, I was really sad, you know, uh, when that worked out the way it did. But all I can tell you is that uh, uh, for a guy that had that much uh, resume power already, he was the sweetest guy I've ever worked with. And I gotta say, definitely rest in peace to him, man. I still can't yeah. believe it. I grew up watching Friends. Even I, Bruce Willis is one of my favorite actors, so just being able to watch him in the whole nine and ten yards films, I mean, it's such yeah. a tragic loss for Hollywood, man. Like I, that's, I still can't really believe it, in my honest opinion. I still think it's kind of, you know, like a ho- those hoaxes you see on the internet. A but surreal kind it's of not. thing. Yeah, I know what you mean. Because he was so there, so alive, so connected, you know. And um, um, it was a great project to be on. And uh, he was a really super nice guy. And I, I saw all the things that happened after he died, and I went, oh man, you know, this guy had such an impact. You know, not only on the audiences, on all the viewers, but even his castmates were torn apart by what happened to him. You know, it's sad. And also, aside from live action movies, you've also done a lot of amazing voiceover work as well. <laughs> you know, one of the most, one of the most great opportunities, because there's so many, but I had, I had to bring this up. You did three different Transformers animated cartoons. Yeah. Uh, where you did English dub. I was what, from two, 2002, sorry, to 2005. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about your time just working on the uh, Transformers. Well, I, I was uh, I really, really, like, uh, humbled to, to get into this franchise, you know, at the time. Uh, the voice they were a- asking me to do was the same voice that Orson Welles played in the original. And, uh, my God, if you don't get shaken by that kind of, you know, uh, uh, following up an act, uh, nothing will. And I knew it was going to be tough, but I had a lot of fun. And um, I, I did okay. Uh, I uh, certainly was no Orson Welles, but I tried to give it the gravitas, the strength, the spirit that, that he put into it in the beginning. 
you know, and then they gave me a uh, couple zone a little bit later, you know, and I did uh, I, two or three Energon Armada. I mean, I can't remember anymore, but uh, I did a, a couple of different uh, series. But Unicron was fun because uh, he was so deadly, you know. It, um, I am Unicron Destroyer of Worlds. You know, it was that kind of slow, menacing, malevolent kind of thing. And uh, it was super cool to, to do that. And, I, you know, playing bad guys is like my bread and butter. So playing the worst bad guy, well, yeah, I'm all over it. I, I had a lot of fun. And I got to say as well, that voice, honestly, obviously, I know, it, I know it was you, but just seeing you do that is absolutely surreal. Because like I said, I watched these when I was younger, man. So that was actually pretty badass. Well, I, I, I thank you so much, man. I, I really appreciate that. You know, uh, the voice work... Uh, has been a real bonus to me because, uh, you know, uh, during my career, it became half and half. I was doing half lens and half mic, and I was having a great time. And then I got Lord Tyrick in My Little Pony, and that was a game changer for me, you know. And uh, I remember auditioning for this, and there was tons of guys wanting Lord Tyrick, but they needed him to be a small, wizened, old uh, a wizard at the beginning, and then a huge senator, uh, centaur near the end, right? And so you had to do that that uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, um, uh, expanse. And so I would go, um, is he friend or is he foe? Was the pony wonders? I can assure you, I am no friend. But by the end of the episode is, Princess Twilight, you have resisted me for long enough. And I got to do those extremes, that whole spectrum. And uh, I think there were guys that could do the older guy better than me and guys that could do the bigger guy better than me. But somehow I did both of those guys better than everybody else could do both of those guys. And, and like, you know, producers like where they can hire one guy and cover two jobs. So that's how I got that. And the great thing about the vibe, about the car, you know, the voiceover work and whatnot, is the fact that nowadays you could probably do it in the comfort of your own home. They could just send you the script. You can just record it and send it off. I don't know if that's possible, but with today's technology, it seems like you really probably could do that for Hollywood. Well, I, I, you know, you're absolutely right, but uh, but the, that's a two-edged sword, right? Um, um, part of the reason why I'm 66 and I'm happy to be uh, semi-retired right now, I still do independent projects if i'm asked and things like that but i don't chase after the roles main reason why is because when i was growing up and doing this i got to go into the room i got to be with the director the producer the uh casting director the camera person the line reader i have a, a few people that i can work off of and then i can react because that's what acting is it's not about acting. it's about reacting authentically to whatever you hear, see, or feel. And so that stopped after COVID. Uh, all of a sudden you had to mail everything in. You had to self-tape and you had to go in there and like uh, scratching a lottery ticket, you had to hope it was gonna be all right because my my um, my skill was adjusting my work. If a, a director said, well, okay, Mark, we like this, but can you do this and this, a little bit of this at the end? I can adjust and I can do that. And that's where they, they hired me. But without that, without that interaction, that connection with a producer or a director, it's like a, a crapshoot. And uh, so I, I uh, you know, the, uh, there's a lot more technological guys out there that can do a sound studio and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but me, you know, I, my thing was just acting. And uh, I, I tried to leave that other tech stuff up to other people. And uh, so I'm glad that I'm not doing that much anymore i'm sending off tapes and stuff like that because i want the interaction with a, a director i want him to tell me what he's looking for and not try to give that to him but it doesn't happen much anymore yeah the industry is unfortunately definitely changing even physical like, i know it's totally off top but even physical media is now kind of going out the door i mean I, I don't mind digital but if i'm if i want if i'm buying a movie i want to be able to buy it and physically hold it and look at the case i mean Everything's going digital and everything's kind of like remote now. It's, I don't know. To me, it doesn't really feel as good as it used to be. Well, you lose a connection. You lose a connection with uh, the other parts of the industry, which is 
you know, not only the people behind the camera, but the audience, right? You, you have that interaction. And uh, um, uh, for me, um, that's uh, a loss. Um, that kind of uh, being um, uh, insulated and, and not having the connection with people and that real time, you know, feedback. Because when you're on, st on, on set, when you're showing up on set, you know, the director will go, okay, Mark, you know, uh, that was good. But he'll just want some tweaks because that's what his job is, is to get that thing just the way he sees it. And uh, you can't com um, communicate that if you're mailing it in, you know, and just uh, sending it in without any real, you know, um, direction. I mean, I think that acting is all about uh, a culmination, a, a collaboration with a, a number of arts, you know, film, uh, directorial, script, and then acting. You know, it has to be a combination of those things. And if I just have to act without any of those inputs from the other people, it's like a, it doesn't ever work as well for me. I need that feedback. I really do. And the one thing I actually read as well on IMDb, and I know sometimes, especially with research, IMDb, anyone can edit it, unfortunately. But I saw that your most recent movie release is actually Walt Disney's Peter Pan and Wendy that actually <laughs> dropped April 28th of this year. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about that. And, of course, what was it like just being on the set and, of course, actually being able to play Old Clamson? Well, I mean, um, um, this is a, a big, uh, you know, uh, feature. And I was uh, um, going to be working on this for, like, a few months. And uh, I was tickled to be in this group. I, I was working with people that I'd worked with many times before and then working with Jude Law for the first time and other people for the first time. And it was big and fun and lots of money and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I had a, a, a great time uh, doing it. And, and then a year later, a uh, director calls me up and he goes, Mark, we want to add some lines. You know, we want to add this and that, you know, I want you to come back and redo it uh, with different lines because we're adding a couple of scenes. And I said, sure, you know. So a year later, I went back and did a couple of more weeks. Um, but uh, uh, sadly, you know, uh, that picture didn't get any kind of uh, release the theatrically because um, uh, a lot of the Disney product before that had not fared well. And so there's a lot of money uh, uh, commitment when you're going to uh, release, distribute, there's a lot of money. And so they just decided to do streaming. Um, it was good. Um, and uh, Jude Law was, was wonderful. I got to tell you a little thing about Jude Law. You know, this is during COVID, right? So you got 150, 175 uh, people, uh, actors, extras, uh, producers, whatever, all wearing masks, everybody wearing masks, except one person. And Jula, uh, for the whole uh, four months, never wore a mask. It was, uh, it was sort of like watching The Emperor Has No Clothes. Uh, but, you know, nobody said anything. We're all really cool. Everything was nice, right? But it was a strange sort of time to be shooting, you know. Uh, but it, it, I thought it looked decent. Uh, uh, it's always hard to, to remake a, a classic like the uh, animation original of Peter Pan and Wendy. Uh, but um, I, um, I was tickled to be in it. And uh, some of me survived, you know, which I was really happy about. And... Um, it's probably going to be my last big feature because, like I said, I'm semi-retired. I'm only doing, you know, uh, projects where people ask me as a favor. Uh, somebody would have to, I mean, I just don't audition much anymore because I'm old and I want to enjoy the rest of my life and uh, not chase after work and stuff like that. Uh, but um, it was a lot of fun shooting that, that's for sure. And we actually have a fan question from Vinny. I uh, asked, would Mark be okay with someone making a print for him to sign for a charity of his choice? Uh, yes, yes, and uh, yes. I mean, um, I, you know, whenever I can do anything where my name lends uh, some help to something more important than me, which is just about everything, uh, then I'm tickled to do it, right? I mean, yeah, and I know Vin uh, Vinny. I mean, he's a great guy, and uh, Vinny Primavera, you tell him that, yes, I will uh, do that for him and happy to sign anything for him. I, I just got back from Vegas about a week and a half ago, 
where I was signing pictures and, you know, taking selfies with people and stuff like that. Did that in Germany in September. It's sort of what I do now. It's just meet with fans and stuff like that. But Vinny's been a long time fan. And of course, I'll do anything for that guy. And I, uh, Vinny actually shot, caught, replied back to uh, the public conversation on the post and actually showed me some of his work. And I have to say, they, I'm a very artistic individual. So I'm very excited to see what he actually comes up with in, the, in this print wise because he is definitely oh, dude, very he's a he serious does. guy. This is a serious guy. I've known about Vinny for like yeah, a few years now, right? He knew me when I first started the convention stuff, right? So, you know, his stuff is legit and real, you know, and, and so I'm happy to sign anything. And if it makes some money for a good charity, all the better, really, you know, yeah. And one of the last questions I actually have for this evening, obviously, as you mentioned, you do a lot of conventions. You just did one in Germany a few months back. You just got back from Vegas. Is Are there actually any more uh, you know, convention uh, appearances? And if so, wh where are you actually going to be next? That way the fans can come out and meet the legendary Mark face-to-face -face <laughs> and get some autographs and some selfies. You know, I, I, uh, I you know, I, I don't want to uh, um, take you to task on anything you said, you know, but like I saw the promo and I went, legendary, I, I, I don't know. I, maybe uh, perhaps I'm a legend in my own mind, uh, but beyond that, I don't think anybody thinks of me as as legendary, but I'm flattered that 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 uh, you would you would uh, say so, and and uh, thank you very much for for doing it. But what was the question again? Oh, uh, I was, uh, you're you're most certainly welcome. And the other question was actually, uh, do you have any more uh, convention appearances coming up? It's something that that I really enjoy. You know, um, uh, My Little Pony brings me out a fair bit, uh, and then I do some Comic Con because of. Uh, Sabretooth and uh, from Marvel and uh, Unicron from Transformers and a few other cartoon characters I did. I love Comic Cons. This was a cosplay that I did in Vegas, which was very strange, uh, different for me, but they wanted me there anyway. But always, you know, especially when it comes around November, you know, uh, the interest in Elf is what brings people up and, and talks to me and stuff like that, no matter what the premise is. And I have uh, a couple of uh, um, conventions in San Diego, in uh, Seattle, and in Texas that I'm looking at next year. I'm hoping to get there. I just want to do just three, four a year where I can still connect with the, uh, the fans because there is nothing better. I mean, there is nothing better than um, sitting with people that uh, actually like your work and want to talk to you about it. I mean, oh, my God, I could... Uh, as any self-absorbed actor would be, I'd be happy to talk about my career for as long as people would listen to it uh, before I became boring, you know. <laughs> and I got to say as well, you, your career is so extensive as well. Doing doing the research for this interview, I, I got stumped because I was like, what am I going to ask this man? No, not because you didn't have anything, because you had so much. I was like, all right, we got to focus on this stuff. We got to focus on some of this. So I definitely can see how amazing your career actually has been. So it's there's no doubt in my mind that fans definitely come up to you and talk talk to you about all your projects because you've been in a lot of amazing amazing work. Well, I was on Reddit the, the other night for the first time in a long time, and they had a lot of questions about uh, me being 26 in the movie uh, Elf, right? And then people start bouncing around. You realize he was the bad guy, you know, in Fargo. Oh, right, and he was the guy, you know, that got his hand crushed in uh, Watchmen and all these things. And I got to tell you, you know, like uh, I've done a few interviews, uh, especially lately, and uh, nobody, nobody has done the research that you did, my friend. I mean, you really topped it out, you know, the skip tracer and all that kind of stuff. My stay stuff. I mean, you're spooky, dude. I mean, you're seriously spooky, uh, but uh, it's been a trip and uh, I really appreciate that. This is the best interview I've ever done. It really is. I got to say that honestly means a lot, man. So thank you so much for that, man. Like just that compliment. I mean that that's the goal that I do, man, is just do these interviews that not only this not only the fans enjoy, but also the individual as well that's actually doing the interview with me. Because at the end of the day, you it's not just my interview, it's your interview as well. You gave me your time, so I wanna make sure that it's worth your time if that makes sense. Oh you you uh, honored my time so well. Uh by um in, in a few minutes retracing where I started, where I grew and where I ended up, and I uh, thank you so much for that. I really do. It means a lot to me. I gotta, 
You're most certainly welcome, Mark. Before we actually part ways here this evening, obviously I, I know how to follow you on social media because that's where we got connected. But for individuals yeah. that don't have you on social media and want to stay updated on your next convention appearances or anything you got going on in your career, how do they go about following you across all social media platforms? Well, the best way, you know, is just to go to either of my websites, uh, markatchison.com or markatchison.ca. Either one it, it will have uh, a way to connect with me, ask questions, ask for pictures, whatever you want, see clips of my work, uh, pictures from my stage days, whatever you want are on both of those sites. So if you know my name, you can find out about me and you can connect with me immediately. And I got to say, first and foremost, Mark, thank you so much for providing not only myself, but the radio station airways with a bit of your time here this evening. And I got to say, from a fan to an actor that's enjoyed so many of your roles for, for so many years, I got to say thank you so much for so many memorable moments on the, on the movie screen. I can actually say that I've watched Elf probably five times every single year, and it never gets old for me. The mailroom guy forever will be the best Christmas scene in all <laughs> of uh, Christmas movie history. And all your other roles as well. Thank you so much for a lasting impression. And I know it's going to last so many years after all, after this generation is gone, your work is still going to live on for, for that, so that, many that years. So Mark, thank biggest, you so much. Biggest compliment I, I could get. And, and uh, I, I thank you so much for it. You know, it's a few days away until Christmas. Uh, but uh, I got to tell you, you know, in many ways, you gave me a really nice present today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You are most certainly welcome. I have to say that the feeling is definitely mutual, man. It's, all, it's always great to just uh, have an amazing interview like this, especially around the holidays, and get to learn a lot more about our favorite holiday films. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're, mo you're most certainly welcome, Mark. Have yourself a wonderful night, and of course, a very Merry Christmas and a great holiday season to you and your family as well. The happiest of holidays to you and all your listeners. Thank you. You're most certainly welcome, Mark. Thank you so much, and we definitely shall talk again sometime soon. Thank you. You're a friend, always. Thank you.